Hello, everyone. My name is Rose Gear, and I'm the executive director of Cascade Symphony Orchestra. I'm here today with cellist and composer Shanti Saito Molina to talk about a new piece for string quartet that she's written. Shanti's new piece is based off of a, a Mexican traditional song called La Guacamaya. It will be performed for the first time this month by four musicians from Cascade Symphony Orchestra. Shanti, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you so much for having me, Rose. So as I was reading your bio, I was really struck by how many different things you've done. You've, you're a cellist, you're a composer, and you're a music teacher as well. So I'm really curious about your path in music. Where did you grow up and, and what types of music did you hear during your childhood? Yeah, um, I was born and raised in Colima, a small state on the west coast of Mexico. And basically, I listen to classical music all the time. <laughs> um, my mom is a pianist and my dad uh, was an architect and a harpsichord builder. So they just loved classical music. But then, I mean, being in Mexico, we I listened to a lot of Latin music and uh, traditional folk music, but mainly I would say just classical music. So when it came to your musical training, um, growing up and then getting formal training in, in college and graduate school, um, what did that look like? And what steps have you taken in your career so far? Yeah, so I, I started learning at home with my mom. Um, she basically taught me uh, early music uh, ear training and musicianship. And uh, I started with formal violin lessons when I was five. And later I switched to piano. And when I was 12, I, I decided on cello. And I, I played cello basically since then and obviously kept up the piano um in mexico i i played with the national youth symphony orchestra and that sort of changed my life into uh deciding what i wanted to do and so i studied music high school in a university institution in colima and then i got a a scholarship to do my undergraduate degree at Washington Adventist University in Tacoma Park, Maryland. So when I was 18, I moved to the US and I started playing a lot uh, in the DC area. And then with that orchestra, we played regularly at Carnegie Hall and Alice Tully Hall and the Lincoln Center um, at Strathmore. And we went on tours uh, almost every every year uh, within the States and also abroad. Uh, we went to Europe several times, um, South Africa, Thailand, Mexico. And so while I was there, I did my undergrad in music education. And then I graduated and worked for a year at a school teaching music, um, Spanish and art. And then I went back to get a, a degree in music performance and after I was there, I got um, an assistantship at Central Michigan University. So I moved to Michigan, did my master's there in chill performance as well. After that, I moved to Mexico for a couple of years and I, I taught there violin and cello and I did some more composing and eventually landed here a couple, well, almost two years ago. Wow, that sounds like an incredible journey. You've been just around the world um, playing cello and, and teaching and composing. Um, so it sounds like your formal training was mostly around um, music education and performance. Yeah. Um, so how did you get started originally writing music? Yeah, so I mean, since, since I was little, I've written things here and there and um, I think my mom has a recording of me uh, making music for like uh, radio, pretend radio commercials. <laughs> and then I have, I, I start playing around with um, garage band and things like that. Uh, but I always thought that composing was sort of this um, 
unattainable thing. Like I was too much of a perfectionist and I thought, well, that's, that's the sort of thing that men with beards and interesting looking faces do. And, and my stuff sounds cheesy and I don't know, too sing songy or something like that. So I, I didn't think that my compositions were worth a lot or worth it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make my own stuff. And uh, fortunately, I got I got asked to to keep doing that. A friend of mine from childhood was uh, doing her thesis for film school. And she's like, oh, can you please write the music for my for my final project for a short film? And I'm like, sure, of course. <laughs> Uh, aside from sing songy and cheesy, I got to the extreme of like contemporary um, and sort of uh, troubled music <laughs> uh, that nobody understands, but would would fit right in in a in a film like like a foreign film or something like that. Uh, so I've been I've been doing a little bit of that, and then recently. I started making arrangements for the Ballard Civic Orchestra uh, for the cello section. And I decided to do, uh, the first one was uh, El Son de la Bruja and La Llorona. Very traditional folk songs from Mexico that I always thought was sort of not for me to play. See, all these uh, stories about oh I'm not I'm not supposed to be doing that <laughs> and I thought you know what I I love these songs they make me really happy and they sound very Mexican and a lot of the time I I struggle with this concept of am I Mexican enough so why not just compose or arrange something that is a very Mexican and that I can play because I'll be playing cello. So this is perfect. It, this just sort of gave me license to to allow myself to do whatever I wanted and just have fun with it. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your, your inspirations um, as a composer. Why um, this particular song, La Guacamaya? Um, why did you choose this song to write this new piece. So, uh, La Guacamaya is a, is a song jarocho or a, a song from this type of music, Sones Jarochos uh, from Veracruz, that was was in the back of my head because I had listened to it um, on occasions. A friend of mine who actually plays a lot of Sones, uh, not only Sones Jarochos, but Sones Huastecos and from other regions of the country. Uh, he came to visit me and I said, can you please teach me this music? Because I feel like something within me is missing because I can't play this music. So he was trying to teach me how to play it. And obviously all this is, is done orally and like just listen and repeat. And because I've had a very classically trained career, um, even though, yes, I can listen and repeat what you just played, I I was putting so many walls up in like, oh, it's not perfect, and am I doing this right? And every every time I would play um, the, the section, like the introduction, I'll be so excited, but so nervous that I would mess up. And so I thought like, oh, how cool would it be to actually be able to read this so I can, I know and I feel secure in myself and in, in my abilities that I can play it and have fun with it. So, and also like the the song is a very happy song. It's, it's just, it's, a, it's in a major key and I usually write very sad and minor key things because I don't know, I just, yeah. <laughs> um, I identify with it a, a lot more, and it's sometimes a little easier to elaborate on on the minor um, the minor keys. But I thought this would be a challenge to to write something that is major and happy, and just how to carry on this this um, feeling of 
happy-go-lucky in, in this music. So that's that's where it came from. Well, it definitely feels very happy. I haven't heard the final recording yet, but just what I've heard so far um, has really given me energy. I'm curious about Son Harocho. Mm -hmm. um, what is it exactly and what makes it unique as a style of music? Yeah, so the Son Harocho is uh, a music style from the region of Veracruz, uh, mainly Veracruz, but also Tabasco and Oaxaca. These are, Veracruz is, is the state on the Gulf of Mexico, well, Veracruz and Tabasco and other ones, but mainly Veracruz uh, in the heart of, of the Gulf. It's a region that sort of welcome, and may I say within quotes, welcome, colonizers and with with the colonizers the spanish uh people they brought their instruments and their traditions and so it's influenced mainly um from the music that was happening in the 17 and 1800s it wasn't just the people from spain but all the the African slaves that were coming in uh, to the Americas. So the San Carocho is mainly from the region of the Sotavento, um, this region of Veracruz and Tabasco and Oaxaca. And it's sort of permeated the Gulf or, or the coast. And then it went to all these communities in the, in the mountains. And it sort of froze because all these communities didn't have um, as much influence from the big cities. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, Baroque instruments, all the, all the jaranas, which are like little guitars. There's a harp. There's also on the African side, there's the marimbol, which is like a big kalimba style um, instrument. And there's also the quijada de burro, which is a donkey jaw. So there's the, the Spanish influence and the African influence and also the indigenous influence. And so the music is not only music with, with the instruments that I already mentioned, but it's also zapateado, which is a dance with, you know, like the heels and, and they make uh, rhythmic patterns. And there's also poetry, which is the verses that they're singing. Um, there's different kinds, like some sonnets are written with like a theme, uh, and the coplas or, or these, um, verses are in a setting where there's only this theme and there's like sort of some sort of story happening. And there's other sonnets that it's just the music that, that makes the theme and the words change and are different. I mean, all the words evolve and change depending who's singing um but there's not a theme throughout the the whole thing you can be singing maybe about the corn over there and then maybe about the lady over here and just different things um but la guacamaya is is a song that talks about the macaw or or la guacamaya and where she lives and what she eats and and then suddenly it's like Oh, but um, they took me away because I wanted to come and see you. And it's like, well, weren't you talking about a bird? <laughs> so uh, there's um, there's this tradition that, for example, um, Son Jarocho is mostly played at fandangos, which are parties. And according to where you are in the sort of evolution of the party, you start singing about simple things and jokes or about more risque things as the night evolves. So there's this whole tradition and it has been evolving, uh, for example, in the last hundred years because of the presidents that were in power in Mexico uh, that were from Veracruz, they wanted to, to bring some Jarocho to the capital city. So they started bringing the musicians and with them, the song has started to evolve. For example, uh, one of the main things that changed was 
that uh, it used to be played with small harps. But then there's this thing, it's so funny because they wanted these musicians in movies and more popular culture. And at some point somebody said, you know what? You look funny because that small harp, you have to play it sitting down. And the rest of the group was standing up with their instruments. So the cinematographer was like, mm, you know what? You need to stand and we can't really hear you. So bring in another harp. <laughs> So now uh, it's common to see a harp from Michoacán, which is a bigger harp and louder harp in this, in this uh, setup. There's this whole tradition like from um, cutting down the trees to make the instruments, uh, learning how to make the instrument that you're gonna play and then graduating from that instrument to the next one. Um, for example, the person that plays the requinto uh, the lead little jarana or, or guitar that is played is usually the person that knows the most or the oldest or, and the wisest because they played all the other ones and they already know how to make their own. Um, and there's a ceremony to know how to cut down the tree and thank uh, Mother Nature for the wood to, to make the instrument. So it's it's a very uh, rich culture and a very rich tradition that not a lot of people get to listen to or experience because uh, another aspect of it is the fact that um, because all this music is is locally played, uh, the tradition is like well you tune to to whatever you feel like or whatever the weather is allowing you to do or um, the, depending on the capabilities of the, of the singer. So uh, there's this whole layer. When I first listened to, to the Sones, I was like, why are they so out of tune? And as a classically trained musician, it, it bothered me so much because I wasn't used to hearing different types of tuning. And most of these musicians learn from their family, like their fathers or mothers or uncles. or And so it's not like, oh, I went to school so-and-so to learn how to play this instrument. No, it's, it's like a community tradition that gets passed down. In fact, a lot of the of the violin players make their own instruments, but they make them uh, the way a jarana would be made, which is from one solid piece of wood, and then you carve it out, and then put the the top lid and the fingerboard and all the other stuff, which uh, in comparison to traditionally um, classical instruments, they're, they're made of several different pieces that are glued like in the middle and carved um, each lid and stuff. So once you start understanding all the tradition and how this instrument sort of uh, frozen time, um, then you start understanding and appreciating more the whole culture that, that goes around it. Wow, that is just so fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just the depth of the history and the confluence of different influences and the complexity that's present there when you have storytelling and dance and music and uh, making instruments all together. That it's just so fascinating. So thank you for shining a light on that for us and helping us to understand that. I'm wondering though, so you described several of the instruments that are used in Son Jorocho. So I'm wondering, how did you recreate or translate the sound of that tradition using Western classical instruments? Yeah, so at first I was, I was trying to be as close as possible to this style and then I, I kind of took a step back and was like 
you know what? I, I need to acknowledge both sides. Um, the one that is trying to recreate and sort of pay homage to the style and the other side that is trying to uh, reinterpret what is going on in in their own in their own style in their own form. So I I need to clarify that I'm not an expert in Son Jarocho. I just love the music and it makes me really happy. So I try to to recreate the feeling as much as possible uh, within the abilities and things that are possible with with the with the classical instruments or the western instruments so for example i try to recreate the rasgueo or the strumming of the jarana with um with the upper strings trying to get them to play it like a little guitar um for example there's a lot of plucking with a plectro which is um a piece of uh, cattle horn that has been shaped to be like some sort of um, pick for the instruments. So that was a little hard to decide because I was like, ooh, what if they get just like a guitar pick and then they start picking their instruments? And I was like, no, 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 let's let's keep it real within... <laughs> within the the format so it's just a lot of pizzicato um and also one of the instruments is the dancer that is uh dancing on top of la tarima which is this platform wooden platform and it's very important to have this this rhythm happening um so i asked the players to do some some sort of percussion on their instruments so it's it's fascinating to to play around with the choreograph of when are you going to put your instrument up or down and what part of the instrument makes a better sound um does the varnish on your instrument make a different sound than than the varnish on my instrument for example some of the cello sections uh on my cello it's like oh yeah no problem this this sounds pretty loud here, but then how do I get that translated to someone else whose instrument may sound completely different just based on the varnish? <laughs> so so I, I had a lot of fun going, going back and forth with this um, sort of mimicking uh, samples, but I also wanted to have people realize that this was written by someone who's very classically trained and and has all these composers in her mind like Bach and Brahms and <laughs> Tchaikovsky and Shostakovich um so I don't think I went very Shostakovichy in there <laughs> but um but yeah so there there are some sections that take some sort of themes from the from the main song and explore them in a more um traditionally western style unbelievably cool i really cannot wait to hear the new piece um so that brings me to the question of uh, you've had a couple of rehearsals already with the quartet what was it um, like to work with them and, and show them how, how they should play the music? First of all, it was wonderful to work with them. Um, and it, it is super exciting that uh, they're playing the music and they're coming in with their own ideas and their own suggestions. Uh, but yeah, the, the main thing was trying to translate the type of sounds that are not native of their instruments. And so we, we did some explorations on both the sounds and the choreography because the music goes so fast that you have to be able to grab your bow and put your bow down and start tapping. Um, so some of it is uh, written in the music and some of it 
we talked about it um, and decided on what made the most sense for for each player. Uh, I shared some videos with them and some suggestions of what to what groups to listen to, uh, but also the stories. For example, some of the moods uh, within the quartet are set by little names I gave each each section. For example, there's one that I love. Uh, there's a, a verse in the in the song because. You know, since this is mainly about singing and responding, um, the music may sound very repetitive, but it's it's it, you have to think about that uh, people are singing verses that may, mainly have the same rhythmic or melodic themes, but then they're responding. In the song, it says um, that the Macaw told uh, another bird, I don't know the word in English, sensontle, like, oh, I'm so sad because the lumberjacks took down my home. Um, so, like, the, the macaw is very sad, and uh, there's a section uh, that is, like, at the top of the trees, but then underneath, there's this um, percussive section uh, that is like the lumberjacks trying to take down the tree. So having that um, visual, I think, because I'm a very visual person, I'm always trying to associate the visuals with what's going on musically. Wow. So storytelling is so integral to the piece. And knowing the story really helps you and helps them understand what's happening and how to play the music. That is so interesting. So backing up to when you were first starting to write this new arrangement, what is the process of, of writing a piece? How did you start? What tools did you use? And what was your process? What did it look like? So first, because this is an arrangement, I listened to as many versions of of this song, La Guacamaya, as possible. Um, not only versions that were sung and performed, but uh, sung and uh, danced, because this is a, a type of song that is danced by a group of women, is a son de amonton, or like a bunch. Um, so, for example, seeing what traditionally um, uh, folk ballets are, are doing and reinterpreting their zapateados or their dancing into rhythmic uh, patterns for the players to do. Um, obviously, listen not only to the sun, but uh, different um, groups because there's just so much variety. Um, it might be the same song, but everybody plays it differently. A lot of also a lot of listening of just string quartets and chamber music from the Western tradition to see how I would resolve some of the ideas of the song into the setting of the string quartet. So definitely a lot of listening and just sketching out how I would like to to set up the order of themes, like how how do I want the piece to go? Um, I'm very scatterbrained, so there will be a thing here and a thing here, and then copy and paste and oh wait, take out and <laughs> and I did this all on uh, a software called MuseScore that you you pay once a year and you can upload your music to the internet and you can write your music at home so yeah i it was it was mostly listening and then just writing out as many ideas as i could um if i liked how a group would do a certain section i would write it out and then if I remember how another one did it, but maybe I didn't remember quite exactly, 
like, oh, I sort of remember that goes like this, and I'm going to add this other thing. And then uh, maybe to make it sound more classical, I'm going to add, or Western, I will add um, this sort of bass uh, to it because then together it sounds like the mix of the two. So, yeah, that sort of sums it all up. <laughs> Wow. So I didn't realize how much listening is involved with composing and you're inspiring me to want to write something. So oh, thank yes. you for sharing. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I, I at, at some point I realized that just not having someone tell me, Hey, you can, you can write too. It's okay. And, um, I, I just wanted to, for example, incorporate that in my teaching even though I mostly teach private lessons, I want my students to know and feel confident in, in their abilities that whatever they have in their heads or whatever, whatever they're exploring is valid and it can be used for something big like a project like this or it can be something just to have fun. And to me, creating is like this ultimate fun project like whatever involves creating to me is is the best so i i vow to whoever i taught i would explore this writing process with and again even if i'm not the best composer just the fact that I am there for my students so they can explore this, I think is, is great and very valuable. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing about your career journey, your life, your inspirations, um, and about the new piece, your process. It's been wonderful. And we're all really looking forward to hearing La Guacamaya. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited. I can't wait to hear it too.